and understand that while I'm creating an image, I'm also taking it. And since I'm physically taking the image from its space, I always want to do it justice because this image that I'm creating may be the only interaction that a person has with that place. And since I really like the place, it better be the photo. Um, specifically, this small little point-and-shoot camera has been one of my favorites because um, there's been a lot of times I've not had a camera on me, and I've always regretted missing that photo. Um, and with how quickly we're moving with urban development in our time now, especially in Georgia with an influx of new investors and new developments, a lot of the places that are in our surroundings are quickly disappearing and changing. Whether that's good or bad, that's for you to decide, but moving from day to day, the places are completely revamping into something else. And going back to the roots of the show, which is the study of nostalgia, um, it's hard to be nostalgic if you can't remember what to be nostalgic about. So, I suggest everyone go and get a camera. We all have our phones, which is wonderful. That's a great thing about the accessibility of technology now. There are good things about moving forward, um, but you just have to make sure that you're conscious of it. have any questions throughout the show or I'm talking about making a particular, please interject. I'd love to answer anything you have on your mind. Um, I hope you all are ready for the quiz that will come up at the end. <laughs> <laughs> it will count. <laughs> um, with that, I'm going to segue to the It's Amazing Trip Dip. Um, this is in homage to the wonderful photographer, William Kristen Berry, who was a photographer from Hale County, Alabama. Um, uh, um, Kristen uh, Berry focused on architecture, abandoned structures, and nature, and essentially just the movement of so with this work, It's Amazing was a beauty supply store that was right down the street from my home in Savannah. Um, it's a documentation of just going by, seeing this place active, seeing its patrons going in and out, and having a thriving business. Um, I believe the first photo was taken in early 2020. So this is from 2020 all the way to 2021, over a whole year, and you have all the passerbys going, the whole community that is around this area, coming to the store every day, going into closing, and then now it's gone. Now it's nothing. Um, or not nothing, but a physical monument to what once was. Which is also where I collected that dollar sign. That was there. Um, the dollar sign is significant because um, if you read Sally Mann's wonderful memoir, Hold Still, she talks about how photographs and memory are fickle. Um, we see photographs as these historical significant things that capture a memory and an idea and it's seemingly tangible and physical and an exact replica of that memory. That's not the case. That's completely wrong. It's not. <laughs> the photograph is 
organic and fleeting and ever-changing. Just like a memory, every time you recall it, it's going to be slightly different. It's going to change. It's always developing, growing, and, you know, because we're all human, it's going to have a better narrative in the end. I want to emphasize the collection of the physical ephemera around us because while the context can change, that dollar sign will always be the dollar sign from the It's Amazing building in Savannah. And that can never change. Um, no matter how differently you try to remember it or try to forget it, that's constant forever. Just like all of these images in this big glass box, would everyone please gather around? <laughs> Um, speaking on terms of collection, one of the things I'm passionate about is the, y'all can get in real close or far away, however you want, um, and you can see it at the end too, we're open until 9 o'clock, so please take your time once the talk is over. Um, these images were collected from different thrift shops and estate sales the trash. Um, <laughs> it's always sad when I find photographs and photo albums. Um, I think about the lineage, the time, the family that cherished them, and then the choice to let that go. The act of choosing to physically forget something. I know I struggle with that a lot. Some of you may know me as having a large collection of items. Um, <laughs> so I do love the analog connection to things. Um, but I think specifically, photos hold a lot of tangible weight. Because um, they're also one of a kind, they're special, and while I did say they're never going to be a perfect memory, they do a pretty good job. Um, I will now talk about my road trip snapshots. Um, this is a direct homage to the wonderful photographer Stephen Shore. Um, this is similar to his first series, American Surfaces, which he created over road trips through America during the 60s and the 70s. While he is well known for taking some large format work, a lot of large format work, he was an early pioneer of color photography and bringing it into the fine art ecosphere. Um, this is essentially a visual diary of my time, my travels. It's my pictorial history of traveling around Georgia, and stopping and looking and appreciating. Um, just like Stephen Shore did at his show, these were all printed very cheaply at you know, your local drugstore, just got all the photos, sent them out, got them back, stuck them on the wall. Um, these are not fine art objects. They are little bits and pieces of memory. They don't really have much context or meaning until we put them together in this space. And I like the idea of how they're small and how it brings the viewer in to look at the pieces and envelop themselves into the travel. It's like taking a little look into my mind. This is it. Um, and it's highlighting the importance that the world around us, there's so much to see. There's so much beauty. There's so much really, really weird stuff, especially in Georgia. Um, and you got to see some of these photos. Like, they're, they're crazy. Um, but it's special. 
very special. I hope you enjoy that. Um, I'm going to direct your attention to these two storytelling devices, the CRTV and the iMac. Mm. Um, with how fast media and technology is moving, these two devices, which at the time, the 90s and thousands, were the pinnacle of technology, <laughs> now they're antiquated and, um, frankly, rubbish. But not to me. I love them. Um, the TV has always been a storytelling device ever since its indoctrination into our culture. The TV is special in that whereas we used to share stories in person, person to person, hand in hand, one person is able to share their story everywhere to broadcast similar to the signs that are on the screen. Mm. All the signs have a specific and usually utilitarian purpose. It's advertising, sharing, and it's giving you something. Something to know, something to learn, something to understand. 60 socks for $10. It's all <laughs> projecting a narrative. With them all together in one place, I'm able to shift the narrative completely and move these utilitarian tools into art pieces. Because though they were made to advertise and um, you know, consumerism isn't the best thing, someone still took time to create these pieces and put their heart into making something. And I think that that should be appreciated because when you start looking around, there's a lot more art than what meets the eye. Some of it isn't great. I only show the good ones. <laughs> um, I'll briefly talk about the iMac. Um, this is not my first computer but it's very similar to the first one I had. The friends that I have that are my age, I feel like we share an identity to where we were born in between the analog and the digital. We still know what a cassette tape is. Still, some of us know what an 8-track is. Most of us know what a VHS is but it's still showing how quickly the generation after us is losing this analog identity. Because I know a lot of photographers past me do not enjoy the limitations that film gives and love the immediacy and the ease of digital photos. But I have a sense of kindred spiritness with the analog media because even though this is digital, there's still something organic, it's still living and breathing, and it's sharing its story with me. It's interesting to think about how we can grow an attachment to a cold, lifeless object. But with the stories and the images that we can put onto it, it breathes life and makes the world a little more happier. Speaking of which, while it's great that I can show all of these images to y'all, there's no sense of actually seeing the place for yourself. With this very large sign I've created of the All-American Package Store. It's my attempt into bringing the viewer physically into the realm that I'm portraying. Um, the, like, I made it as big as I could. It's really, it's huge. Like, I mean, you can, you're not supposed to touch the museum stuff. Like, you can just, like, get up in there. There's so much to look at. And I feel like a lot of the images I'm creating have a lot of detail, but you just 
there's nothing like seeing it in person. So this is a challenge because we already are studying for a quiz at the end of the talk. We're all getting cameras to document the world around us. And now we're going to go find spaces that we care about that are really cool, that may be mundane and looked over. and. forgotten, but we can give life to this photo and the memory behind it and um, someone's going to really like it 30 years from now. And now. You better like it now. Too. <laughs> now we're at the salon wall. At the beginning of the talk, I mentioned how this work was done over three years. What's special about that, and what's special about having shot this whole show on film, is that I did not look at a single photo until deciding to make the show happen. I did the exact opposite of what I'm telling you to do which I took all the photos, I hoarded them, and I forgot them completely. Mm -hmm. um, that was more or less intentional. Um, it's also kind of a money thing, because film is very expensive. But it allowed me to remove myself from all the biases that I had from the photos. I was able to just see them as good or bad photos, as representations of the spaces, and not have any emotions from when I took them. That helped me create the selection of images for this wall. Originally, there were 1,500 images. And with the help from my very good friends, we narrowed it down to this selection. Specifically with the salon, they are strung up in a web, there's no rhyme or reason to why they're hung up or what they're connected to. But as an example for the viewer to understand that each image has its own narrative and its own story, but you can start branching off, making different connections and creating your own narrative by looking at the photos in tangent with one another. You can also see how throughout the photographs you start to see different objects and ideas that get translated from place to place. I did think about labeling them with locations and times and dates, but I decided that everything would under compass Georgia the state, and like the book says, the planet. Um, but it's, you don't really know where they are. I want you to recall and think about the memories that they produce, but also some people have known them, some people remind them of a place that's not even in Georgia, and they're special little snippets of this whole state. How am I doing? Am I, is this good? Good, good. Cool. Yeah. Woo. We're almost done. Um, that is sad. Um, there will be questions at the end. But for you to ask me, I'm going to ask y'all questions and quiz you. Because you got to remember, there's a test coming up. I hope you're ready. It's a test now. It's half your grade. But you can also ask me questions before we take that. This triptych is very special. Um, there are some religious motifs throughout the photos. And I thought it was necessary to include because we are in Georgia. Um, and that is part of our state and a part of our culture. The triptych originally was a religious item that told a story and was used as an altarpiece. 
with the main story in the center and then the two facets on either side. The main emphasis in this work is the planet. Um, this is a water tower that was originally conceived in the 1940s and has survived to this day. They, it used to be painted uh, kind of like the school globe with all the little lines and like the different colored states. Mm -hmm. Then the hurricane happened. I forget which one. That one. <laughs> they repainted the whole thing. What's special about this image is that everything surrounding it is now gone. Everything has been leveled. The whole space is completely empty except the world. Soon to be a Chick-fil-A, Parker's, and Starbucks. Hooray! <laughs> but they kept the world. And I really hope it continues to live on because I see less and less imagination and creativity mm -hmm. in the common architecture that we have day to day. Um, while there are, I'm sure, very talented architects creating wonderful pieces, for the standard homes and commerce that we share, it feels like we are going towards a more cookie cutter and not a good feeling identity with the spaces that we share. So I really do care about the environment, the place I live in, but also the monuments and spaces that we interact with and share every day because they do have a direct reflection on our identity and memory and our persona. And if we allow buildings to not be cool and different, then it's just going to be a really, really sad place to live in. On the last page, um, I, think I'm, I think I'm doing pretty good. I'm saying um too many times, but that's something that I'll learn to work through. <laughs> but we're also saving these best, not the best, everything's the best, these incredible interactive pieces. Before I get to that, I will mention the sign trip tick. It's another monument to commerce, another monument to storytelling and telling or sharing ideas and sharing thoughts to people. I specifically have focused on capturing signs because they are getting phased out more or less. We're always going to have physical signs as media to advertise to us, but as we're moving to a more digital world, these monuments to commerce are stuck in an odd sense of timelessness and time moving forward. Specifically, Sidar, <laughs> um, if you can see really down back there, Chow Chow, um, like that's special. It's telling you one thing, it's one simple idea, I think. Maybe. I'm not really sure what it's about. <laughs> but someone took time and effort to create the sign and to give that to us. So we all have side art. <laughs> I'm going to step into Grandpa's office. This is the first interactive space that I've set up. Um, with special thanks to Abby Wiggum, who helped me get all of this from Statesboro, Georgia. Um, this is a single estate find, because um, I love estate sales, I love thrifting, I love collecting, and this came from the home of Catherine and Hubert Tankersley. As you can see in the photo, it is the exact office and the exact setup as it was found. 
I know that estate sales can seem weird and intrusive because you're stepping into the life of someone else. And in that sense, we're stepping into the objects they've curated and used to represent themselves. So it feels very, I don't know, like kind of creepy and like heebie-jeebies, because, I mean, also, usually the person's no longer with us, which is also a little scary. Um, but with this specifically, I'm wanting to emphasize the feeling of exploration and curiosity. We're going to take a little trip back in time to when we were little kids, going to your grandpa's office, and just sitting down and exploring. Um, before any of these things really meant anything to us, they all meant something to Hubert. Um, and going through these drawers bring us back in time to where, I don't know, digging through your grandparents' stuff is really cool. It yeah. still is. It's blundering. Blundering. It's blundering. <laughs> what are you doing here? Blundering now we come to the crux, which is Gus's living room, <laughs> also Grandma's living room. Um, while the Tankersley estate is an exact replica of what that is, in their office. Grandma's living room is a vignette into what I see. The, the air conditioning kicked on, it's really hot. I gotta talk and project, be louder. Yes. This is Grandma's living room. Yeah. A round of applause for Grandma's living room. Look at that lovely view. <laughs> I love to collect, I love to thrift, and this is what I feel is my memory of a cozy and comfortable storytelling environment. I did my best to represent everyone's grandma in this collection. From the couch, to the TV, to the strawberry candies, feel free to take one or two, but no more than two. <laughs> and then the physical photo album itself. This thing weighs a lot. It's really heavy. Um, which, I figured out today, emphasizes the weight that photos have on us. These are physical memories that have been captured, cataloged, and set aside for the purpose to share with one another. With the way social media has been moving, it's been very scary to me. I'm really worried because um, Instagram's really scary and I hate social media. It doesn't feel right. It feels very wrong and intrusive and I'm not the biggest fan. Please check out the Instagram live stream. <laughs> but I want to put emphasis on the physical photo itself. While I know that taking a photo is one thing, and printing it's another thing, and putting an album is another thing, but it's really, really important to document and hold on to our stories, but also to share. Because I feel like I take a lot of photos on my phone, and they just sit there in the ether, in the cloud, and then I just forget. With the environments that we used to share, specifically the living room, and specifically the photo album, it's conducive to sharing with one another, with family and friends. And it's important. I, I don't know how often we're still storytelling to one another through images. And I'm really worried about losing that sense of physical storytelling in the culture. Um, 
but <laughs> there are still good things to come because I hope that what we've talked about today will inspire you to slow down, to take a look at the world around you, to appreciate the beauty we have not only in Georgia, but from wherever else you're coming from or going to. There's a lot of beauty to appreciate, and if you don't take the time to look at it, it will disappear. It's not going to be there forever. Time is always going to move forward. We're always going to um, lose the places we care about. It's kind of inevitable. Um, that's a little sad, but I hope it's enough of a push to have you appreciate where we are now and enjoy the things that we have around us because they're really special and this whole show shows how much I care about what we have. So I hope that you'll be able to sit in Grandma's living room, relax, pet Gus, eat a strawberry candy, look at the photos and gaze out the window because the time is now. The end. So you talked about having um, years and years of negatives in a bucket that you didn't look at, mm -hmm. and also about having years and years of photos on your camera roll on your phone in the cloud or wherever, um, and that that feels like it's a that feels like those are also sort of forgotten about or something that you don't look at. Do you feel like that medium like 
eliminates the possibility of, of finding yourself working through your archive of like a lifetime of digital photos? Or do you feel like that's a, the, po the possibility of what you did here exists in your camera roll too? Definitely. I'm glad you asked because film is not as accessible to everyone as I'd like it to be. I appreciate its analog nature and its the livingness that the photos provide, but I do plan on sometime going through my years and years, I don't know, since like the iPhone 3 till now, <laughs> I think we're on what, 14, 17, X? There's a lot. Um, so I do think there is the step that people can take, because even, even just sending off photos from your camera to print them out and to interact with them, it's just moving it away from that vault, that digital screen, that they just kind of, I don't know, they don't feel like real photos until you're actually touching them. But it's definitely possible and encouraged. Good question. Good question, you all. And everyone's asked questions, so I'm happy. Um, I noticed that there's a sound part playing. What is that? So that was made by my good friend, Bennett Gergen. Um, he went through and created a tape loop with found cassette tapes and digitally mixed them with a synthesizer and we collaborated on this project to come up with a soundtrack that induces nostalgia and memory. Um, it will be released on Spotify relatively soon. <laughs> it's really good. Check it out. Any questions? Um, you said that the process of taking your photos makes you slow down. How long does it take from the time that you decide to take a photo to like actually taking the photo? It's a mix. Um, like I was talking about with the different cameras I use, um, the point and shoot is usually pretty instant. Um, since it's always in my car or at my side, fireworks photo over there, that's just leaving Walmart, pulling over, jumping out, taking the photo, and keeping, keep on going. Um, but then there's times like the Peach World, I took it with my Nikon F2, which is 35, and I really loved that scene, so I wanted to go back and recreate it. So they don't ever leave my mind, all these ideas. But then the limit to that is I took the photo, I went back a couple months later, and all those peaches are gone. Mm -hmm. um, so I, it's constantly going. Um, with the It's Amazing too, I'm still going to do another photo of It's Amazing where it's completely empty. I'm sure I'm going to take more photos of that weird bent up sign at the Dairy and Outlet Mall. I need to go take Nick's with the blue sky. Um, I'm constantly reworking, constantly thinking about all these images and also the progression of time. So, like the It's Amazing series, that's over a year. Um, but there's places where I'll go back to just again and again. And living in one area for so long, I'm able to see this progression. And I'm always taking photos. So, I hope that answers your question. I do have a question about. Um, so the portraits that you're interested in are portraits of people that you found in thrift stores, you know, the, the portraits mm -hmm. of, but you're actually not showing or documenting people. Is that something that you mm -hmm. see yourself exploring or? Because you seem very attached to those photo albums, but at the same time there are no people, I mean almost no people mm -hmm. in the yeah. pictures. That's a tough one. I... That's your quiz. You don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> That's my quiz. I hope I get the answer right. Um, I find taking photos of people very difficult, especially with the interaction that we have with the camera. I do have a lot of, as some people know me, I have a little digital camera um, that I always take with me and I take little snapshots. But all those photos are usually candid. When I try to go and take a portrait, there's so much that changes in the person between our interaction, 
my physical influence with the camera and the process of taking the photo, I don't feel like I can justify taking a photo of someone as well as I would want to. Whereas with the buildings, they're constant in that time, and I can really focus on creating that image and choosing how I want it to be shown. And I don't. Um, while there's no pictures of, or not many pictures of, photos of people in the show, there's still a lot of humanity in the photo because it's a representation of who we are, what the person who created the building cared about, what the person who repurposed it cared about, the color, the painting, the, the choice of artwork, everything, how we decorate. Um, it's a very ab abstract portrait of a person. That was a really tough, I'm still going to work no, on that answer. Less <laughs> I do have another question. Yes. Do you think that the fact that you were not born here in the U.S. give you that pride, not pride, but that deep interest in documenting and finding words here? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, it's hard because I've lived here for so long. This definitely is my home, but it doesn't always feel like home. You're like a spectator. Mm -hmm. I'm definitely like a spectator. And that's there's a number of reasons why. Um, and also, just you know, growing up in your small town, you don't always appreciate what's around you. So not only am I choosing to document Georgia as a spectator and just trying to understand Georgia itself, I'm also trying to rekindle my appreciation for the place I lived in, because I have my emotional and age biases from growing up here, but I'm able to, again, step back and appreciate what's around me. Mr. Peter, did you have a question? Oh, it was just an observation. Um, standing back here and looking at you and the wonderful people here, but up until that corner, uh -huh. um, I'm noticing we're here there's the outside, we hear your soundtrack, we hear the sounds outside, but we see this marvelous, like a simulacrum, I guess the right word is, that, and I want to go out and break the fourth wall and get in there to be a part of it. <laughs> that make sense? And yeah, I mean, this, I think this is the best time, for me, visually, this is the best time to be in here is at nighttime, looking at, because there's the windows, there's the glass, there's, it's very interactive, which maybe part of what you're doing. Yeah, no, that's the whole... It's a good feeling. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That, that's a good point. I'm glad you brought that up. Um, I wanted to put physical spaces that people could enter in the show because I'm very concerned about the accessibility of art, especially art to the quote-unquote layman. Um, I feel that high-end art and modern art and art in a museum, it's always put on a pedestal, which is usually good, but it definitely takes the viewer away from the physical interaction. There's always a distance in a space. So having physical photos to flip through, being able to sit in the environment, to touch and to feel, there's just so much more process than just visual cues. I'm sure most of y'all, if not all, have seen a painting or a sculpture that you're just like, I really want to touch it and feel it and understand it. <laughs> There's so much more depth to art than just appreciating it from the third perspective. I really want art. I want to touch and feel and look and smell and maybe taste the candy, don't taste anything else, that's the only thing you can taste. Um, so yeah, I, I appreciate that observation, because I think interaction is very important. Yes? I noticed that your only like, semi-national brand that was included is Waffle House. 
Can you talk about the inclusion of Waffle House and maybe the exclusion of other like chains? Yeah. Oh yeah, Subway. <laughs> Subway might be in there. Subway was in there because it was an oddity of COVID. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, if you take a look, there's a very cryptic and scary sign about that. <laughs> um, uh, but Waffle House is a chain, but I, I mean, everyone's been to Waffle House. <laughs> Waffle's important, it's special, it's a part of the South. It's another meeting place, another portal of storytelling, and I mean, if there's a natural disaster, that's the one place you can go, that's still okay. <laughs> so it's a safe haven, and if there were any chain, that's the one that makes me feel most at home and most close to family. And I don't know, the other, it's the best. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else have a question? This is your, well, this isn't your one opportunity. I don't think I'm going to put this into words well, but it feels like a lot of southern brands try to call back to this sort of Americana feeling that you've portrayed so well here. I'm kind of curious on your perspective as to what the difference is, because I can't put it well into words, but you know when you see it, these modern brands that are trying to feel like a callback versus the actual what you see when you're trying to buy small town America. I'm curious on your perspective on that. I apologize that I didn't put oh, that that's as well a good as I wanted to. Um, I, I really think it's just in the heart. Um, you can tell when someone's trying to replicate and trying to revive identity that they don't understand. Um, and while I have pictured these objects as an outsider to this area, since I grew up with it, I feel like I'm just photographing my spaces around me. I'm not trying to project an ideal or project an idea. I'm just trying to show what is. And what is that I'm showing is Georgia. It's a pretty good answer. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Are you influenced in any way by Norman Rockwell about how he showed pictures of people in, in I guess because he also focused a lot on the family and the people, but it is a facet, I guess. Um, it's what's interesting about that is I do see there's a lot of um, like Americana representation and a lot of kind of like family value and. Um, old South and small town America, but I didn't go into the show with those ideas in mind. They kind of, with collating and going through all these photos after being away from them so long, those narratives kind of developed themselves. I couldn't control it all. Um, which I do think helped me create an organic and natural representation of Georgia. It's, there was bias in choosing, but the, there were no bias in the photographs because I tried to photograph as much as possible. So yeah, those were naturally occurring narratives. Um, any more questions? Well, if that's the case, thank you for coming. Eat, drink, and be merry. <laughs>